Okay, now start. Okay, here we are, uh, our third day on uh, our trip to uh, July trip to uh, Central Asia, the history, culture, economics, and uh, I'm very glad uh, we have uh, Joshua again here, uh, who lived in China for a year and a half and learned a lot about the culture. So we wanted his uh, kind of opinion on a new silk road. So Joshua, welcome. Uh, please. Uh, okay, it's a to... pleasure being here. I'm very happy Thank to you. be here. And um, what I'd like to do, new silk road is a very big topic, but just to give you a taste of what's going on. What is a silk road? Why do they even call it the new silk road? And what is actually going on? So, actually, the, all, the ancient Silk Road started about in the Tang Dynasty. It was about 6th, 7th century. And it was actually created by the Chinese people who were living somewhere in uh, Gansu, Xinjiang, and from Xi'an. Um, and also Qing, Qinghai. So, basically, from this area, kind of, all the way to Europe. And that lasted pretty much for a while. They actually built the Silk Road. Basically, the Europe would provide them with horses and honey, and they provided Europe with uh, silk and gunpowder. So that lasted for a very long time. Um, Marco Polo took the famous Silk Road coming from Italy to China. Um, but the, the point where it started, and also it's uh, another major point, was Xinjiang, Omochi, uh, which is the Muslim Uyghur. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uyghur. 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 Yeah. Area. That's Turkic Chinese. And right now that's a very controversial area because there's accusations there about different things going on and at the same time it's part of China so there's complex situation. But basically this is where the last point of where the Silk Road used to leave from. So it's a very important strategic place because if for China to do future with the rest of Central Asia and Europe, it has to go through that area. But the Silk Road lasted, uh, it used to be more like the, the ancient Silk Road was involving more um, of a traditional, like a very precious, various kinds of precious goods that they couldn't really get otherwise. It lasted until the Portuguese colonized the seas and they actually made their way from the seas, they became a naval empire preceding the British, of course. And then until that time, the Silk Road was very much in operation. Um, and basically, and then, um, and that's, and that's a, a legend that follows history until today. It's a very strong uh, memory that we have as a civil, as in multiple civilizations. Uh, another interesting thing is that the ancient Silk Road had very strong trade with Sogdia, which it used to be an ancient Iranian empire, or maybe Sogdia. Sogdia. Yeah. A part of, large part in Tajikistan. And even prior to that, right around the rise of Islam, it was, there was the Persian, um, there, were, there was also a Persian empire called, uh, it was called uh, Sansanian. Yeah, uh, Sasanian. 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 Uh, yeah, the Sasanians Sasanian. were the second uh, big uh, empire, uh, Sasanids. Sasanians or Sasanids. And they, they appear in uh, history around the uh, 3rd century after Christ, uh, after uh, the Parthians uh, actually disappeared. Because when, remember we, we spoke about that when Alexander moved in and burned the Persopolis, he tried to reach the India, and then he made his residence in today's Afghanistan, Tajikistan. And that's how Sogdia was formed. Uh, like uh, uh, they, they say, the historians say, in those days, uh, the most of the uh, people who lived in Sogdia uh, were actually blonde, red hairish, uh, uh, so they weren't Turks. They were kind of uh, northern people who were moving uh, down. Even now, when you go to Tajikistan, they speak Fars, uh, 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 like uh, uh, Uyghur, they're Turkish, definitely the same, uh, Uzbeks also. And then you have uh, Mongols uh, up north, you have Kyrgyz who are something in between, and uh, the, 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 the Tajiks are like uh, Iranians. And uh, they even, some of the Tajiks, they remind on, uh, on Celts, you know, like uh, with the frickles and stuff. 
So it's very interesting. So when uh, Alexander came there, and plus uh, his soldiers and the local people mix, and uh, the, one of the most beautiful people on the planet are actually living in that uh, part of the world. And that was Sogdia. Yeah. So please continue. Yeah. So if we look at the roots for today, I just even though we're going to go into that a little bit later, I just want to mention two quick points now. It's very interesting that today China has a very strong trade relationship with Iran because at the past it also had a very strong relationship with Iranian uh, empires in that region, Persian Empire. And also, right, for example, right now China and Iran decided to sign, they're working on negotiating, on uh, de agreeing on a trade deal, on a major, not trade deal, but major economic cooperation for the next 25 years. Now they're in the final discussions about that, or maybe not yet final, but during the discussions about that. And another point, as I said before, you have Xinjiang, which is a Uyghur region, which is part of China. And basically the New York Times, for example, says that China has concentration camps there. And China says that they're, what they're doing is they're doing retraining for the citizens there so that they'll be de-radicalized. And then some people say that the people that are being oppressed, other people are saying that the people that are being um, pushed by other powers to go against China so to make trouble for the Silk Road. So there's different perspectives, certain different perspectives on the situation. But it, it is still interesting that, um, yeah, I just thought it was relevant that if we look at Xinjiang, it's a historically a very strategic region. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the new Silk Road, which is what we have today. What, what, what people say is happening today. Uh, basically in 2013, President Xi uh, Chinese President Xi in an appointment in a meeting he had in the university in Kazakhstan he said that he has a vision to create a new Silk Road and basically what has been happening since then is that China has invested about at least I think 227 billion in different uh, regions in infrastructure, energy, trains, electricity, uh, railroads Sorry? Investments all together Yeah, investment what? investing in the... In the region, yeah. Yes, in the, in the various regions of the New Silk Road. Yeah. But maybe we can watch the movie now. Uh, the first movie, or maybe, it's, yeah. So the movie yeah, would be... I'll okay. I'll make it. Yeah. Just to give you guys a taste. Okay, I need to see there. Thank you. So... So right now, the major investments that are happening um, they're coming under criticisms from different perspectives because some people say that basically what China is doing is that that this new Silk Road is good mostly for China but not for other countries. Other countries say it's actually very good for them. Um, yeah, that's it. We can see that to get a sense. From the Silk Road was an ancient and legendary road that brought wealth for centuries between the East and West. Okay. Now, as China enters the world stage, one of its primary missions is to bring that source of wealth back. Spanning multiple oceans and continents, China's new Silk Road is a colossal effort that promises global supremacy. But in order to truly understand the potential of a new Silk Road, we need to go back in time. In 130 BC, Emperor Shu of the Han Dynasty ruled over vast parts of what we know today as Eastern China. Shu, facing mounting threats from the north, wanted a solution that would quickly get rid of the invasions and also expand his empire at the same time. Rather than push north, he decided to expand west. Shu's decision to expand the Han Dynasty westward set the foundation for a trade route between China and Europe and eventually a road would stretch from the city of Xi'an in the east to the north coast of the Mediterranean Sea. For 2,500 years, the route dominated global trade. Legendary explorers like Marco Polo took that road from Italy to China, bringing things like horses and honey eastwards. And in return, Europe received gunpowder, paper, and most importantly, silk for the first time, which then lent its name to the road ever after. In fact, it was not until the Portuguese discovered a sea route between Europe and Asia that could bypass the Silk Road entirely that an alternative existed. However, within the century, sea travel to the Far East would then overtake the Silk Road, and by the mid-1400s, China's lucrative trading path faded from existence.
until now. In 2013, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that he was going to revive that ancient Silk Road. At first, it was a hard concept to grasp. He called it the One Belt, One Road project. But as it slowly unfolded over the next few years and billions of dollars flowed out of China and into the hands of capital-hungry developing countries, it became clear what it was really meant to be. It was a colossal design that aimed to put China front and center on the world stage. The Belt and Road Initiative, as it's now renamed, started with three roads. The first over land, reviving that ancient road to Rome. The second over sea, linked China to the Mediterranean, through the Indian Ocean. The third, through the internet, called the Digital Silk Road, <laughs> that linked countries already signed on to the first two routes, but taking that relationship with partnerships for things like telecommunications and digital payments to the next level. But the Grand Chinese Project quickly ran into a massive roadblock led by its number one economic rival, the United States. As China handed out trillions of dollars in seemingly no strings attached loans, they were in fact high interest or conditional offers, which many of the countries found difficult to repay. This created a unique situation where the Chinese could easily seize collateral from these countries to recoup their investments. That's exactly what happened in Sri Lanka. The Chinese took control of a strategic port called Hambantota, which then set off alarm bells in DC. China uses so-called debt diplomacy to expand its influence. Today, that country is offering hundreds of billions of dollars in infrastructure loans, yet the terms of those loans are opaque at best. Just ask Sri Lanka. That rhetoric has been intensifying with the Chinese now deciding to add a fourth road to the Belt and Road Initiative, a polar silk road. In January 2018, President Xi announced that China was going to develop new shipping routes in the Arctic. It was going to team up with Russia to develop energy and infrastructure projects in the Arctic Circle. But by this time, DC had heard enough. The Silk Road's Leviathan-like nature and larger-than-life ambitions were becoming a threat to America. Being attempts to develop critical infrastructure using Chinese money, Chinese companies, and Chinese workers, our Pentagon warned just last week that China could use its civilian research presence in the Arctic to strengthen its military presence. We need to examine these activities closely. But as China threatens the global world order, becoming a major adversary to the United States, and challenging its hegemony with its visionary plan with a new Silk Road, it also has to weather another storm that has hit its shores, Trump's trade war. That's it. Very good. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was very good. I just uh, made it. It long. actually gives in uh, five minutes uh, everything uh, we would like to My address. My name is John Chambers. Yes. I'm now a wanted man. So. So. Then there's Josh. one other video, but I'll just say a few things before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so uh, tell us. Uh, I mean, th these five minutes are, you know, clear. Uh, th there is always interference. Now I can go home. Huh? Now I can leave. No, no, <laughs> no. We, we need your review on uh, like a, a deeper uh, kind of uh, analysis on, on, on this five minutes. So uh, the, the plan uh, uh, to revive the Silk Road is on for seven years. Uh, the, a lot of money is invested. Yeah, a little bit less than I said. I mean, it's probably around 227 million, not billion. I'm a little yeah, bit million. Bit about a million, yeah. No, probably. You reckon more? 270 million, man. I've seen the roads in um, Tajikistan and in Kyrgyz Kyrgyzstan and in China. And like I've seen, like it's a lot of money. I don't know if it's a 270 billion, that sounds a lot of money, but it's definitely not 270 million. So maybe something in between. Uh, we don't know that, but uh, the investment is uh, going on. Uh, there is a vision. Uh, it, uh, 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 a lot of people think it's a positive vision uh, on, on the way the, the Western Europe and America and the North Africa are interconnected. So why won't be Asia interconnected and finally connected to the, 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 the rest of the world? I don't, 
see that as a threat. So uh, Pompeo uh, looked like a very kind of uh, suspicious on the Chinese activities, saying we have to close that, uh, we have to watch that closely. Uh, well, what that, what, what that means? Well, what many people are worried, the criticism of China that often you hear is that China is setting up countries in a debt trap. Yeah. For example, many African leaders are very eager for investment and they'll accept, they, they would like to accept easy loans. Right. So China gives them a lot of money and then if they can't pay back, then China says, okay, you don't have to pay us back, but we're going to take your ports or your fields and your uh, streets or infrastructure, especially ports, uh, vast areas, we're going to take over this and this and this and this and this. But you can't uh, pay us back. The International Monetary Fund does the same thing, right? The banks are doing that uh, uh, all over the world, the west and east, the north and uh, south. So The argument that people make on the other hand is that right. the, the IMF does give countries money that it, they may not be able to pay back, but at the same time it tells them how to modernize their economy and how to reform the economy so they can be more competitive. Okay. But then the counter answer for that is that while the IMF does tell them how to be more competitive, they also push them on a neoliberal way, which kind of like cuts off the public sector, even makes them sometimes less competitive with global transnational Western corporations, sure. and also puts them into a, a debt trap. And what China says, and a counter reaction to that, which is that we don't tell countries what to do with our money. If some countries want money, that's okay. We're going to give it to them. But of course, if they can't pay it back, then it's our right to take reports, for example. But we're not forcing them to take the money. They want to take it, go ahead. But we're not forcing anyone to, to take this money. Sure. So we're not giving them conditions what to do with it. We're not telling them what to do with their economy. We're not telling them how to build a society. We're not telling them what kind of human rights you have or don't have. Right. We're just investing, and you can decide what you want to do with the money. And it's strictly business, right? Yes. Uh, Strictly doesn't. Well, uh, on, on the way, uh, uh, on the way, uh, that's uh, probably more honest, you know, because uh, if you give uh, money to somebody who is able to use it right, uh, then you don't interfere in, in their uh, in their local business, you know. But if they don't uh, invest right and they create the because they're corrupt or something, then 